Yesterday, Surat, I welcome each of you to the second session of seventh day of international virtual workshop on global seismology and tectonics. Today, we first we have with us Professor J R Kyle as a session chairperson, and Professor Sebastian Diabrico, the University of Malta, as a chief guest. Today. Uh, the, uh, the speaker is Dr. Sorok Pura from CSR and Nisura. He is going to speak on the complex seismotechnics of northeastern region of India. But before he deliver his talk, may I request our session chairperson, Professor J.R. Kyle, for his initial remarks. Over to Professor J.R. Kyle. Oh, thank you, Santanu. Thank you so much. Uh, it's my great privilege and great pleasure to be chairing this session and uh, today's speaker is Dr. Saurabh Borua, Chief Scientist of NEIC Jorhat. He is sitting with grey hairs and white beard and looking, you know, a towering personality. Shoro Bodua is always a very kind, warm, loving young brother to me. I know him for last 30 years, some three, three decades. He first discovered me Possibly he came to know about me from publications and sometime in 1994 or so, he visited Calcutta and visited GSI to meet me. That was the first time I met Dr. Sorob, a young man with enthusiasm of doing seismology and he gave his introduction to me. So since then I know him. Then eventually we became very brotherly and he also became a very key scientist in Eden Jorhat. And since early 2000, we are on Indo-Russian collaborative projects, international project since early 2000 to 2013 or so. So we had long association in international projects. He was the co-PI, then he was also PI for some projects. So like that, we were working for last 30 years together. And he is a man who is very good in computational sociology. Any new work, any new program, if it is available through person or through internet, he will download and he will try to do the analysis with the new program. So I think any on any subject, right from waveform inversion to stress tensor inversion, to anything and everything, Dr. Borua was very active, very dynamic, as first of me, and very, my very loving brother, my very loving colleague at the same time. At one time, there are some half a dozen PhD students under him when we were in Indrasian project. And we all used to work together. So that was the golden time when I used to come almost every, almost three times a year to NIST and work together. So I have a very long memory, very fond memory with NIST and with Dr. Borua and his whole team in that laboratory. So actually I, I love that laboratory, I love that place and more so for Saurabh's very warm heart and warm hospitality. So anyway, I can go on 
talking about him, but I think I must stop here. So today, I think he is one of the one of the most veteran seismologist man of the soil in Northeast India, who records earthquakes, who analyze earthquakes, who interpret earthquakes. So today evening, we have a great speaker from Nish Jorhat, who will speak on Northeast India earthquakes, Northeast India tectonics. So over to Shantanu, please. Thank you very much, sir. Now may I request our chief guest, Professor Sebastian Diemiko, for his remarks. Over to Professor Diemiko. Professor Diemiko. Thank you, Shantanu. Good afternoon, everyone, and good evening to everyone. Um, Thanks for the invite and very well done for this very uh, I'm pleased and very honored to be part of this team and um, I'm sure that the lecture of today will be an excellent one and very informative about the complex seismic, the seismotectonic um, set of uh, Northern East India. I have shorter memories than Prof. Prof. Kayal. My interaction with the NIST is uh, quite recent, and I'm pleased that I start collaborating with uh, the NIST, and I've been, uh, I had the great pleasure to be in Jorat uh, last February, before the whole pandemic uh, took over. But I really, really hope to come back again and to start profitably to to work and uh, to study that part of the world much, much more and to have a proficuous and a very, very fruitful collaboration with this uh, excellent team of scientists. I shall stop here and leave the floor to Dr. Tora for uh, the next steps. Thank you. For your class. Uh, let me read out a short bite of Dr. Sarupura. Dr. Sarupura is working as the chief scientist at Sierra List Zorat, Assam, a prominent research scientist in the year 1996 University of Assam. The case in the field of seismology, professor, dozens of PhD thesis have research first in different national and international journals of repute. He was one of the and of the network of Northeast region of India. of the Observatory at the school Assam for India. He was one of the winter members of 18th India. We indeed glad to have this international virtual. So, may I request Dr. Borwa to deliver his Dr. Borwa. Thank you, Dr. Shantanu. Thank you so much, Professor Kayal, sir, and Sebastiano. Good evening, everyone. Sir, excuse me, sir. Professor Ramesh Singh also online. You can greet him also, sir. Yes, uh, uh, Professor Ramesh Singh as well. Nice that you all are uh, on this lecture. Uh, indeed, uh, it's a really great pleasure and uh, privilege that uh, uh, we, we are attending this international virtual workshop on global seismology and tectonics and uh, it has been uh, today maybe the fifth day of this uh, virtual workshop and a very important topic uh, uh, that has been covered through this lecture that is complex seismotechnics of uh, northeastern region of India why it is complex and the what is the complexity parameters that will be discussed here and these complexity parameters 
are not only seismological parameters, very vivid geology is involved. Geomorphology is involved. And above all, the present day geophysical investigations that are really an important aspect that uh, I will try to cover through these particular deliberations. If we happen to see 160 million years ago, Jurassic earlier Cretaceous time, that the movement of Indian plate towards the north, and this is as a whole we say is Greater India, and there is a Tethys Sea surrounding and it is included with Antarctica and Australia. And gradually, by 59 million year late Paleocene area, what we have seen that there is a northward movement which has really developed a significant entity that is Proto Himalaya. And subsequently, there is a delta accretion zone and delta progression along with the subduction which has been observed in this uh, 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 I mean progression. And gradually, when we see in 44 million year late Eocene, the entire scenario is almost clear to us. Himalayan collision boundary has formed and it has reached maximum to the east and its syntaxial band serpents and it wide ocean basin. It's a wide ocean basin still. And we'll see that ocean basin where it was. It was just at this juncture and gradually the delta progression stops. And that way, the present day scenario, the present day scenario that we find that total Himalayan 4D zone is very much unstable. There is a subduction zone to the east. There is a delta basin in the, what we call Surma basin at the I mean, at this part of this northeastern region of India. And this particularly gives a really a varying tectonic types, tectogenes. So these varying tectogenes is the source of attraction for many of us. And if we really see this particular map, present the map from Kremer et al. 2003, then we find that the progression is the directivity, GPS directivity map indicates that it is moving towards north, north, uh, uh, I mean, uh, northeast. And there is a Himalayan boundary. And entire, if you see, there is a rotational uh, uh, movement at this region, at this regions, this is a rotational movement. And if we happen to see, this is a 40 millimeter uh, uh, in the Arabian Sea, and this is 55 millimeter per year along Bay of Bengal. So there is a relative uh, uh, velocity. Sometimes it is observed that it is pushing uh, uh, straight away with a higher rate here and it's a relatively lower rate here in the Arabian Sea. But the most interestingly, there is a rotational point. That means when there is a rotational point where we get Java, Sumat, I mean Indo-Myanmar subduction zone and the, it is connected to Java, Sumatra as well. But why there is a rotational point? What is the reason? Because there is a movement from southward direction and there is a movement northward directions and as a result there is a contraction 
between this Shillong Plateau and the Himalaya, Shillong Plateau and Himalaya. And this being the cornermost part, cornermost part of rather extensional part of Indian plate. What we see exactly, uh, 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 I mean, this is really a complex region. And when we look at the rotational point, which has been said in 90s, the rotational point is somewhere in this part. And when we look at the rotational point, this point is nothing but the Wenchuan province of China, which is hardly 300 and less than 300 kilometer away from India China border. And in Wenchuan, we know what happened in uh, uh, Wenchuan provinces. And that provinces say that on May 12th, 2008 at 228 p.m. an earthquake measuring magnitude 7.9 on the Richter scale uh, happened in Sichuan. 391 dams were damaged by the earthquake. 69,000 people were killed. 3 lakhs, 7, 3.7 million injured. Almost 18,000 people listed missing and 4.8 million people homeless which has just happened 300 kilometer away from Indochina border of northeastern region of India. And exactly the at Sichuan province, the city has been built on the fault line. And this is the status of that particular city. And in that city, we don't have, we never had mapped the fault through active fault mapping. We don't have, we never had the seismic hazard map. We have built houses on the highly elevated zone where topographical amplification occurred. And what we see here, maximum of the houses are totally damaged. You can understand. And exactly that Indo-Tibetan or Indo-Eurasia, that rotating point at the point of rotation, all these happened. And we are not knowing that we have built a beautiful city just on top of a fault line. This city is now totally abundant. Had we made the seis proper seismic hazard assessment, this scenario wouldn't have happened. So what we see, we saw from this earthquake, this is 1950 earthquake and the Wenchuan 2008 earthquake is somewhat near here. Professor Kayal has described the stable continent SCR earthquake. All the earthquakes of other parts of India in Gujarat, Jabalpur earthquake, Kilari earthquake. I would like to stress upon two great earthquakes that has occurred in northeastern region of India. That is 1897 and 1950. And in a process, what is the lessons we have learned from this particular area? The rupture is unknown till date. What is the extent of the fault? That is also unknown. So these are the some of the questions uh, uh, that is very much prominent towards development of a proper seismic hazard map of northeastern region of India. So when we see complex tectonics, seismotectonics of northeastern region of India, we must have to see the northeast in a very holistic way. This is Arunachal Himalaya, which is part of Tibetan Plateau, we can say. This is a collision boundary. And this is the syntaxial band. Sichuan uh, province is, Wenchuan province is somewhere here at this point. There is a Rima Valley, 1950 earthquake occurred. From China, we see, or Tibet Plateau, we see three earth, uh, uh, big rivers. 
that is coming down. This is Siang River. And this is Lohit River. This is Divang River. And this is, uh, uh, I mean, Lohit River. And if you happen to see, this is the Himalayan Frontier Thrust Zone, which we call sometimes HFT. And just a little beyond, there is a MBT. This is beyond, this is full of Shivaliks. And beyond MBT, there is a, I mean, it has started main crystalline thrust, what is prominent here, which is nothing but an Himalayan orogenic belt, as we understand, as we know. And if you happen to see to the east, it's the most interesting zone. And why it is interesting? Active subduction is going on here. And today, this morning at 7.30 IST, one force point six magnitude occurred in this Indo-Myanmar subduction zone. And if you happen to see, uh, this is the alluvium plain of, that is we call Brahmaputra Valley. This is the Brahmaputra River. And these Brahmaputra rivers, it's the length is almost 700 kilometer and it passes through, uh, uh, I mean, Brahmaputra Valley. And right now it is devastating with its floods, fury. And while crossing the Brahmaputra, there is a place called Kajiranga Sanctuary in this basin where only one horned rhino is available. And beside that, there is an extension of Shillong Plateau. This is called Mikir Hills. And this is entirely Shillong Plateau. If we happen to see a Shillong Plateau, this is the, uh, 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 I mean, Dauki Fault. And this is the, this is also extended almost uh, more than 400, five, uh, 500 kilometer. And as you, see there is some fault existed here and which I'll come later and gradually uh, uh, I mean this Brahmaputra crossing the Surma Basin goes to the Bay of Bengal and if we see this subduction zone this is the accretionary zone uh, what we see totally compressed zone and here I'd like to mention today morning while uh, uh, I mean, Professor Kayal was delivering one question, answering one question that is Bhagjan blowout site. This is the area where that Bhagjan blowout site occurred and it is full of uh, oil deposition here at this point. So we remember Xiang River, Lohit River, uh, Dauki Fault and all these places will roam around in a few minutes of now. As I just explained, this is the 1897 earthquake. The rupture is still unknown. This is 1950 earthquake. This is tentatively placed here. This is in Rima Valley, where there is two large thrust, that is Lois thrust and Mizumi thrust that existed. And here exactly which is the particularly uh, rupture area or which is the epicenter that is still unknown. And apart from these two large earthquakes, uh, there is seven large earthquakes also occurred, which is greater than seven here. And as we see, as I mentioned, this is the MFT and this is MBT, these big lines, red lines, and this is the MCT. And where you see the uh, in the Myanmar subduction zone, and this is the San Sagang fault here. And this is in a Christianary zone. This is a beautiful city, Ijal is situated. And right now, Jorhat is somewhere here. Jorhat is somewhere here. We are calling from uh, Jorhat. And as mentioned during Professor Singh's lecture, that we have a multi parametric geophysical laboratory, and that is uh, situated in and this particular reason that is Tejpur. And beside Tejpur, there is a mega fault that is, which has produced again, 1943, seven magnitude, seven and 7.3 magnitude earthquake. And this is called Kabali fault. And again, there is a, another fault, which is not available here, shown here, that is Bombdela fault, flanking that Tejpur reason. Why it is flanked, 
and that we understand from this GPS directivity map along with the strain map uh, from Univaco. This is the highly stressed gen where MPGO is situated. And as I said, if we happen to uh, include the GPS directivity map, then we see this is a there is a uh, complete rotational um, view uh, as we understand. And this is the highly strained region, and this has been uh, taken from Univaco website and superimposed with the faults and lineaments and the mega thrust uh, 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 on this particular map. And when we look forward, the uh, uh, 15th August 1950 great earthquake of magnitude 8.5 and above, then here we'll try to see there are a lot of studies has been made, but still rupture area is unknown. So we'll look for the rupture area. There are some of the, uh, I mean, I being a seismologist, sometimes worried about that seismology, just recording earthquakes and uh, go for, uh, I mean, analyzing and interpret and throw the focal mechanism solutions and stress tensor inversion and subsequent tomography and all. But that is uh, a part of seismologist, but there is a big role to play as a part of structural geologist, geomorphologist, and a, as a geologist. So being a part, I always wanted to roam around with the seismologist, I mean geologist and geomorphologist. And as a result, we saw some of the unique features. Uh, of course, it is from Kingdom and Ward paper on 1950. What we see here in this uh, figure that has been taken from King and Ward, uh, on 1950 that a lot of stones, rocks and that is embedded inside the uh, tree trunk and why it has been embedded. What was the furious nature of 1950 earthquake? What was it totally turmoil? The reason so that the stone uh, rock mass was lifted up and embedded inside the uh, tree trunk and that was a big uh, question. Here, that means a rock mass may be segregated from a bigger uh, rock mass and lifted up and went inside, hit the tree trunk and got embedded inside this tree trunk. So it gives us a, a very big information. So for seismic hazard is consistent. That means this has particular earthquake of 1950 has produced uh, more than an acceleration greater than 1G and, and as a result that stone mass was uh, broken up or stone mass was uplifted from the base and entered in, so in uh, hit the tree trunk and entered inside the uh, inside this uh, particular tree. So uh, this is also from Kingdom and Ward and this is the landslide and where he mentioned that hills split in half by the earthquake. And this was the picture taken just after 1950 earthquake by King and Ward. And when we see there is a splitting, the splitting he tried to mention somewhere here, I think. But <clears throat> very recently, when we move, very recently when we moved to the area, this is just at the bank of uh, 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 River Lohit, we see uh, there is a huge landslide and it has been established that the earlier this entire landslide was due to uh, 1950 earthquake. And as I mentioned that this particular uh, uh, figure and the last figure what I showed, this is the same figure uh, this was taken, uh, I mean, uh, just after the 1950 earthquake and that particular figure was taken uh, just uh, uh, recently. And when we see uh, a place called Demui in the Lohit River, that there is a bridge and that's from that particular bridge, this particular uh, uh, figure, uh, I mean, photograph was taken. And when you see the photograph, then here, uh, we see uh, a, some kind of abrasion 
that means what has been established that there is a huge fault uh, dominant abrasion is here and that fault is passing along this particular region and when there is a huge amount of water flows during monsoon and as a result there is a, uh, a cause of this abrasion uh, i mean uh, during that particular maybe during that particular earthquake so this is some of the features that we wanted to see and when we moved to the syntaxis syntaxial reason there we saw another typical uh, geomorphological features and if you see this is the inaccessible terrain in the river side during winter season these are very, very much visible if you see the four layer uh, uh, grass layer i mean tree layers four layers of tree and these are nothing this is the oldest scarp and this is the uh, recent scar and from vegetation itself we could demarcate what are the uh, uh, i mean uh, fault scar and what is the what could be the probable rate of upliftment and that way when we visited all those places uh, search, uh, searching the fault scar then it has been another river sections we have found that this is the scar and the fault line is maybe passing through this particular region so that way it has been established as well in siang river to see the remnants of 1950 earthquakes or uh, what is the uh, exact geodynamic figures and the tectonic figures as i mentioned that siang river this is flowing through natural himalaya from china uh, and it is the just at the uh, foothills of Arunachal Himalaya. This photography was taken, and if you see the stratigraphy of the bed of Siam River, it indicates that it is oriented towards south. The dip is oriented towards south, and many more interesting features we see we uh, observed near the banks of uh, Siam River uplifted quaternary sediments and this is the quaternary sediments in the river banks and of course due to active tectonics soft sediments intrusion in clay all these were uh, visible along along the bank side and this is the exactly taken the uh, this figure was taken from the uh, i mean road side just it is the road side between the river siang and uh, this particular bank and now what we conclude from here either uh, this is the uh, particular bed river bed up uplifted or maybe uh, the present siang river has eroded down uh, to the present uh, strength present condition right at this moment but as we understand this there is a lot of pure sand observed here and uh, this sand obviously the remnant of siang river only which we call as a quaternary deposit so these are the features that has uh, exclusively indicated that how active the reason was uh, when these all happened and we visited uh, uh, this particular uh, place and this is uh, it's a very interesting reason to survey around and this is the rowing fault scar here in a place called rowing and we have uh, identified 14 feet uh, i mean uh, um, uh, fault scar and uh, we have uh, also under tried to understand what is the fault rupture here uh, at this point and there is a prominent river that is kamlang river section and this Kamlang river section, as we understand, this is the fault scar. This is the fault scar, and the fault is moving along this direction, dipping along this direction. So uh, uh, this could be. This is at, the fault is crossing the river at this point. And as we understand, when we go to the near Teju, in a called Wakro Fault scar. And this is a place called Wakro, where there is a big sanctuary uh, available. There also we could find what is the, uh, uh, I mean, uplift uh, of the fault scar. That is something around eight feet. So all these uh, conclusion, I mean, all this information 
helped us to understood what is the rupture extent of the rupture area due to 1950 earthquakes. And a lot of studies has been done on this particular thing to understand the complexity and to understand the contribution of 1950 earthquake uh, uh, through active fault mapping, which has been published recently uh, in EPSL in 2019. So as we understand uh, 1950 earthquake, uh, we go to the 1897 earthquake, Great Shillong Plateau earthquake. And again, I have explained this uh, particular figure already, but this particular figure uh, this is the extent of this hat type figure you see here as well somewhere here. This hat type was the rupture area as uh, estimated by Oldham, early, early Oldham. But equally, this isosesmal map, apart from this isosesmal map, another interesting map sketch uh, Oldham in 1899 published, he has uh, um, drawn. This sketch is like this. There are two, this is a beautiful sketch. There are two pebbles again here, which was somewhere here. This is the original place of uh, uh, these two pebbles. This is the original place of these two pebbles. And these two pebbles were lifted up and it has come up to this level. So what it indicates, it indicates the same conclusion. That means that 1897 earthquake has also produced an peak ground acceleration, which Professor Susan Ha yesterday mentioned that it is it has exceeded the peak ground acceleration of more than 1G and nullified the Earth's gravitational pull and uplifted and tossed up and uh, almost thrown almost five meter away. This particular figure is a very good indication for seismic hazard assessment right at this moment. So as we understand the Shillong Plateau we have talked upon and this is the isosesmal map of 12 June 1897. It has devastated almost to up to Jabalpur, up to meet India region, you know, uh, Tibet Himalaya. And also here there is a very good uh, monastery in Tawang, Urnachal Himalaya, that was totally de devastated, I mean destroyed during this particular earthquake. And of course in Koch Bihar, there was a three-storied palace, palace, and that three-storied palace, the um, ground floor was totally subsided inside the earth. So those are the, uh, I mean, isosesmal map uh, that has produced. And the most severe part were the western part of uh, Shillong Plateau and of course some parts of uh, Assam Valley. As we understand, to understand the remnants of 1897 earthquakes, again there is a beautiful flexure of rocks observed dipping south in near Dauki Fault, Meghalaya. And this beautiful flexure is just throughout uh, near Balpakram Fault and Balpakram uh, sanctuary which is in the just receded in the Indo Myanmar, uh, Indo Bangladesh border. As we go, as I said, as I said, uh, uh, there is a, live, a lot of limestone queries, and, and this is in Balpakram National Park, Meghalaya. It is near uh, Indo Bangladesh border as well. And as I said, it was totally in ocean. The entire uh, Himalayan frontal thrust up to um, Himalayan frontal thrust, Bay of Bengal, oceanic water oceanic involvement were there and when it has receded it has eroded the entire uh, limestone rock mass throughout uh, and to, the, why it is a oceanic because there is an existence of a lot of pneumolytics embrosed limestone in that particular area reason and all these features has evolved the complexity of geotectonic behavior of northeastern region of india as we understand the bangladesh this particular reason uh, we'll see what is the remnants and this is the Bangladesh border uh, and there is a beautiful roadable road almost 400 kilometer approachable road is there and there is a flat coordinate this is a totally a basin and there is a, a south stone uh, I mean sandstone and this is always uh, uh, I mean south dipping bed and which is pushed towards north and this is the Dauki fault, remnants of Dauki faults, so what we are observing, we have seen there itself. 
and more interestingly we have also seen nearby just it was a photo was taken uh, uh, from the foot wall and inversion of river bed uh, we have seen and this is a textbook kind of uh, shear zone what we have uh, seen uh, alongside the river. This is near Kachipara and Indo Bangladesh border. That means this particular thing exactly indicate that how much tectonically active the entire region is uh, presently. And as we understand, it's a SRDEM map. And when we see the uh, uh, observe the study map, then you see here this is the Dapsi thrust and this is a, a, a dormant trap. So no much uh, activity we observe here and this Dapsi trap, if you happen to see the elevation map somewhere here and this is the topmost uh, region somewhere existed here at this uh, uh, I mean place and uh, this is and beyond these very interestingly there is a faulted zone there is a folding this is between bangladesh plain and chakpur thrust there is a folding going on somewhere here and this folding is maybe due to the uh, huge convergence of extension of himalaya uh, indian himalaya or indian plateau uh, or maybe the meghalaya plateau towards uh, uh, i mean bangladesh plain uh, could be the uh, probable uh, information that why this folding is occurred. So this folding is very much prominent for us right at this moment for seismic hazard assessment. So with all this information, we have tried to uh, we have rigorously visited uh, all these uh, places in 1950 and 1897. And in 1950, entire uh, false scarp could be evaluated and which has been published in EPSL 2019 and entire rupture area could be extended from seismicity point of view and also from uh, these geomorphological features and that was but uh, uh, we are yet to resolve the um, issues somewhere here in this part of the uh, 1897 rupture area. As we understand, the complexity is very much reflected uh, in elevation map. In Assam plain, if you happen to see the this CC uh, profile, and this is the Assam plain, and this is Assam plain, and this is the Indo Myanmar subductions ranges, uh, which we call also belt top supen, and somewhere in volcanic line, then Sun Sagang fault. This is very much prominent here in this uh, I mean elevation map. But to our surprise, when we see the uh, uh, gravity map, when you see the broad gravity map, there is a really a variation in gravity uh, uh, throughout the terrain, throughout this section. And it is visible. We have taken so many uh, I mean, uh, sections and in all sections it is prominent. When we try to see again the magnetic ma anomaly map, here also we see the variation of magnetic anomaly. And this itself indicates that the vivid nature of geological condition underneath, uh, 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 I mean, this uh, particular reason. And so far, the seismicity and depth section is concerned. Because as I said, it is it has produced two great earthquakes and uh, it has produced uh, seven large i mean 27 point magnitude earthquakes so daily a lot of earthquake comes today morning also one 4.6 magnitude came, uh, came in uh, this particular region in the indo myanmar region and if you happen to see if you happen to, if you close your eye if you happen to see this is the seismicity map this is the seismicity map from ISC database from 1897 to uh, 2017 plotted. And here it is the regional network. We have a network and this regional network uh, produce, uh, was established in 1984 and up to 2017 it is mapping the entire seismicity scenario in northeastern region of India. And that's why you see the cluster of events is much more higher uh, here 
and that way if we see the depth sections and these depth sections uh, east west depth sections then we see the indo myanmar subduction zone the earthquake is something sometimes around 120 kilometer and if we happen to see the depth section plot of this it's a very interestingly in indo myanmar uh, region it is up to 120 kilometer but uh, throughout the northeastern region of the average seismogenic zone is uh, 45 kilometer. So it's really a uh, highly seismically active zone. And if you happen to see, if you close your eyes and put your finger uh, on this map, you find an earthquake uh, epicenter here. But what is the happening at depth? That when we try to see at 0 to 45 kilometer depth, uh, we see that there is a lot of earthquakes in 0 to 45 kilometer, uh, I mean, a little bit uh, devoid of in Assam Valley. In the Myanmar, we see a lot of earthquakes, but when we go to 45 to 90 kilometer, then yes, uh, Indo Myanmar subduction is very much active, too, but rest is decreasing, except somewhere in Tejpur region. And when we go above 90, then we see the seismicity pattern still exists beyond 90. I mean, uh, so as we understand this particular reason subduction zone is very much active, but where we don't see much earthquake, we don't see at all earthquakes. And this may be the, uh, I mean, some of the earthquakes, which is not overestimated. Uh, but the thing is that this particular area, northeastern region is uh, almost seismogenic zone. If we consider for seismic hazard assessment, something like 45 kilometer depth. So that was the scenario as we understand. As this is a, <clears throat> an workshop we are organizing. So little bit of theory, I would just like to uh, uh, indicate that what is the uh, um, exactly uh, dynamic elasticity and which is nothing but uh, a theory of elasticity. Uh, here um, for these earthquake occurrence, we record the earthquakes and what is these earthquake? We call this earthquake record as seismogram. That is nothing but UT and uh, this seismogram is the combination of uh, three important parameters. That is source parameter, uh, medium, medium means uh, the path from the source to the recording station and the instrument response. That means the whether your instrument is totally calibrated one, you know uh, the digital instruments, uh, uh, I mean counts per se versus uh, uh, ground velocity. So when we multiply all the source effect, medium effect, and the instrument uh, effect, then entirely we get seismogram. And here, theory of elasticity follows Hooke's law, theorem of uniqueness and reciprocity theorem. And of course, this medium uh, we call as the Green's function. What is Green's function? That Green's function is nothing but the seismic impulse response of the earthquake of the medium, seismic impulse response of the medium. Now, we uh, uh, actually infer uh, um, this seismogram as a time domain as well as a frequency domain. It is our choice for how we move forward, either time domain or a frequency domain. But we have to know very important point that our seismogram is nothing but it's a combination of source effect, medium effect Green's functions and the instrument effect. Now, a simple equation allows you to understand about the source effect. This is the simple equation. This is the seismogram divided by the Green's functions divided by the instrument response. So when you divide this particular uh, seismogram with the Green's function and the instrument's response, the amplitude division, maybe the frequency division. So there you understand exactly the source characteristics. So I'll just touch up on a little bit on the uh, uh, um, uh, very important aspect, what we can do uh, through 
of SEGRA after uh, digital event of digital seismograms. And you can, we can determine focal mechanism solution. This is the best predicted model uh, right at this moment. And this best predicted model uh, is uh, uh, a kind of model which is, uh, I mean, worldwide it is used. And as it is a, a um, workshop, I'll just to say that means there is a in amplitude spectra inversion and whole waveform modeling we call. And the first step we use for this whole waveform modeling that is nothing but we consider time, latitude, longitude, depth, and uh, uh, I mean um, moment magnitude, seismic moment, not moment magnitude, but the seismic moment. And after knowing the whole in, uh, waveform, and we try to uh, infer the centroid location where it is time domain inversion. This is the uh, uh, steps which is very much available in literatures. But again, I just want to touch upon these uh, particular things. And when we see the time, latitude, longitude, and depth, and seismic moment, therein we incorporate one more uh, uh, point, probable, one more point that is strike deep and rake. And this strike deep and rake, when we uh, infer, we probably we infer, we try to do a incorporate one kinematic model. These are the three steps we have to understand. And there in kinematic model, what we do actually amplitude spectral inversion and it can be through a P wave inversion, it can be through a S wave inversion, it can be through a, a total, uh, a, I mean, waveform inversion. And here we see, try to see the strike deep and rake of the earthquake and rake of the earthquake. And what we, you may ask what we try to understand. We try to understand the focal mechanism solution. As Professor Kayal has already mentioned, what is fo focal mechanism solution? That it infers that strike deep and rake. And there is two planes. What is the exact focal plane that we can infer out of this particular uh, uh, method? And the strategy uh, shows that this is the source characteriz uh, characterization. And you have raw earthquake. This is the raw seismogram. And this raw seismogram uh, you just invert and try to create the synthetic seismogram. And when you try to create the synthetic seismogram, you try to uh, combine the raw seismogram with the synthetic seismogram, try to match rather. And uh, when you try to match the amplitude in during that process, when the amplitude is totally matching, both for raw seismogram and uh, synthetic seismogram, in that case, what you establish, there is a barest minimum uh, error, uh, what we call RMS value. When there is a barest minimum RMS value, uh, for, we can infer exactly what is the strike deep sleep of that particular uh, waveform inversion. And here, very importantly, we have to have a, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, very good crustal model. And that way you find the uh, through waveform inversion, uh, the focal mechanism solutions, which gives you uh, the idea of focal mechanism solution. And that way you can characterize the source. So we have seen what is the source characteristics of Dauke fault. And this is the strike slip in Dauke fault, what you observe. And this is sometimes we also get normal faulting in Dauke fault. So this is somewhere we are, uh, we have some scientific questions still, uh, whether it is a normal fault, whether it is a strike slip fault, this Dauke fault based characterization yet to be made, but it is true that it is always north dipping. Uh, and the trend of the strike is east west. So that way we characterize the Dauke fault. Same way, the Tista fault also we have characterized, which is absolutely uh, strikely fault. And if you happen to see the Dhubri fault, which is also, which has all this uh, fault has gigantic fault has produced. Uh, uh, I mean, 
um, more than seven magnitude earthquake. And this is the trend is north south, and this is the trend is north south. So that way uh, you can uh, characterize the fault, and this is the normal uh, course of action for a seismologist to understand the focal mechanism and characterize the fault because ultimately it will be the input to the seismic hazard assessment map. That way also we have assessed the syntaxial zone, as I said, the near 1950 earthquake. So when we characterize the uh, sources, then we are able to understand the fault behavior, fault nature, and above all, we can infer a very important uh, parameter that is known as seismic moment and that seismic moment is nothing but seismic uh, 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 it's a energy out of that particular earthquake. So that is a very important uh, information that we get from source characterization. So uh, this is the beautiful tool which is now um, very much available uh, worldwide usage and uh, we must avail this particular uh, tools to characterize a uh, fault. And here, if you see, this is the particularly Indo Myanmar region. And this Indo Myanmar region in overriding plate, in plate boundary, in venue of zone, uh, uh, this particular uh, earthquakes, whatever occurred. And this region wise, we have, uh, uh, I mean, characterized the entire source domain. And this gives us an understanding about the um, behavior, seismic behavior of that particular uh, seismogenic zone uh, in indo myanmar region. That way, see a vivid uh, uh, representation of focal mechanism solution throughout northeastern region of India. And throughout northeastern region of India, when we see we based on the earthquake seismicity focal mechanism solutions, what we did we, for say hazard mapping, we have devised the entire region into nine seismo, ten seismogenic zones and ten different seismic identity. And these ten different seismogenic zones, one thing we have followed, it is a mixed kind of uh, focal mechanisms available and this mixed kind of focal mechanism what is available that is exactly uh, not uh, very much clear to us that means uh, which is prominent mechanism existed uh, in northeastern region of India. So this is also another questions that we should try to resolve that which kind of uh, uh, focal mechanism solutions is pertinent to a particular reason uh, that is uh, uh, is yet to be resolved. So now this particular output or the focal mechanism solutions where we get uh, information about the strike deep and ray and this strike deep and ray can be the input for another uh, estimation which is called stress tensor inversion. And if you see the world stress map, this world stress map is a, uh, I mean, replica, uh, I mean, it has been estimated from um, uh, in situ measurements, fault fractures, or uh, fractures, but not exactly from focal mechanism solutions. So, the, as a seismologist, we can also make an input to this particular earthquake, uh, I mean, stress map. And as we understand, this is called stress tensor inversion. And here we have to know this. Where is the stress condition? This is well known to all of you, the students, particularly uh, the new students who are uh, budding seismologists. They must know uh, that this particular feature, uh, uh, zone, I mean, in the form of a cube, are. Uh, uh, I mean, replicated with the uh, three by three matrix and uh, having nine components. And if you happen to have a tensor uh, stress, you cannot define the uh, because it is scalar quantity. So you have to transform and incorporate the tensor. And when there is a stress tensor, exactly uh, a, you can invert to a, a domain where we really try to resolve the shear stress and which is 
uh, uh, just like this. It is S double one, S double two, S double three, which is sometimes recalled as sigma one, sigma two, and sigma three. And in this in this case, one thing is pro prominent that sigma one is the highest one, sigma two is the middle intermediate one, and the sigma three is the uh, uh, I mean uh, the lowest, uh, least one, least one. So when we can infer the sigma one, that sigma one itself gives us a peculiar establishment. And how we do? Just I'm touching upon for the budding seismologist. If you happen to have focal mechanism solutions for your reason, please do send us the uh, uh, input file. Please prepare an input file with deep direction, deep angle, and slip. Uh, uh, utilizing strike uh, angle, deep angle, and the slip angle. So, what is deep direction? This is deep direction has to be. Uh, this is strike plus 90 degree. That is the deep direction. You have to have some degrees of, of strikes and uh, plus 90 degree. It gives you the measurement of deep direction. And then again, one condition is there. If deep direction is greater than 360, then deep direction uh, you have to uh, do like this uh, DD minus 360. And as a whole, this deep direction is very much important, which is a uh, deep direction on this input file. And this is less than than the deep direction you keep as it is. So. Uh, this is the format how you have to prepare um, the uh, input for stress tensor inversion. Now, after this, um, there is a good point uh, that means uh, best resolution. There is a point what I prefer to you all. Uh, that means uh, you just prepare uh, for your reason. Uh, the strike deep and rake and the deep direction uh, deep and rake and send the file. I will try to uh, do some kind of uh, work uh, for you for your reason along with your seismotectonic map. And that way, uh, what we have done, we have employed that output of focal mechanism solutions. And you see here, and this has been published in BSSA by Dr. Shantanu Borwa et al. And you can go here uh, where Professor Kayal and myself is also co-authors. And here we have just uh, seen the earthquakes epicenters and these are the uh, crusts. I um, mean some of the uh, what we call uh, cluster of earthquakes. So cluster wise when we have inverted, uh, try to understood the Sigma one, how it is behaving. And this is the uh, um, in status of Sigma one as you understand. And mostly uh, we have been for these uh, two reasons for cluster wise, depth wise, uh, and of course, uh, reason wise. And that way we get a lot of information uh, uh, from focal mechanism solutions through in a stress tensor inversion. Now you see here a very important information what we observe. What we see. This is the uh, depth range 0 to 45 kilometer. This is the depth range 45 to 90 kilometer, and this is the depth range uh, 90 to 160 kilometer. Now, as we understand, uh, 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 if you see the stress tensor inversion, that means the orientation of principal axis sigma one at deeper depth, at uh, I mean lower lower depth. It is almost northeast directed. It is almost northeast directed. If you down go little deeper, that is for 45 to 90 kilometer depth, and it has come closer to north, come close to north. The sigma one has oriented towards north. Earlier it was north northeast, but it has come towards north. But when it has gone down 90 to 160. It is almost oriented towards uh, uh, I mean not so di not so directed, which is the trend of Indian plate margin, which is the trend of Indian uh, collision 
convergence zones. So these are the some of the features that we could infer uh, uh, from this particular uh, stress tensor inversion. And as I understand, this was published in Geophysical Journal International in 2009 by Professor Late Angelier and myself uh, to this uh, work. And likewise, we have also done uh, depth-wise what is the synthetic stress map. And this is the entire domain characteristics what we see right at this moment in that particular publications we have published. And this is uh, uh, you know, peculiarity is that in Shillong Plateau, if you happen to see the Shillong Plateau, rest of the plateaus is uh, almost uh, rest of the places are almost oriented according to the geodynamic, but Shillong Plateau is something unique. Why it is unique? It is western part of Shillong Plateau is uh, Sigma 1 is acting along this direction, uh, not northwest directed, but in eastern part of Shillong Plateau, it is not northeast directed. So this is the uh, peculiar findings uh, uh, that has been carried out here. And a lot of uh, receiver function analysis a lot of, uh, uh, I mean, um, anisotropic analysis has also been carried out, which is not uh, being discussed right at this moment. So that way, depth sections also we have inferred because these all information is, uh, uh, I mean, the prime input to the seismic hazard assessment of this. And this is a very well known figure. That means with different GPS studies, we have tried to see how uh, the um, velocity vector is varying and moving. As we understand, this is uh, the GPS velocity vector with uh, 14 to 15 millimeter per year in Shillong Plateau, and this is directed, and uh, in and this is also directed to, uh, towards this direction. This is uh, with RTR's RF reference frame. This is with LASA, and interestingly, uh, what we observe from here that. Uh, what is inferred from stress tensor inversion that is on synchronization with these two different reference frame. And this is a point of question. Uh, we have to why this uh, from two different reference frame. Uh, uh, this is being resolved along these two uh, stress axis, principal stress axis. So this is a very important question that we are yet to answer why it is so. We have also done the seismic tomography. Uh, um, uh, as I understand, this tomography uh, with 54 seismic station data through LET, local earthquake tomography. And very interestingly, at 20 kilometer depth, at 20 kilometer depth, we have inferred some of the uh, very highly uh, low velocity zone. And this low velocity zone persisted uh, in near copley fault region, near copley fault region. And when there is a low velocity zone along a fault uh, dorm, uh, region, fault structure, and that is a, 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 a that means a, act as an stress accumulator. And probability could be there, there is a, uh, a probability of occurrence of an earthquake in that. That has been inferred through these particular tomograms and which is yet to be published, which is not published as of now. As I said, had situation, Sichuan province known about the probabilistic seismic hazard assessment, the devastation wouldn't have been so much. So whatever I showed in this map, and uh, ultimately uh, this is uh, where we have to end up for the Earthquake Resilient Society. And this is a very known uh, map and following this map, we have devised the seismic hazard map of northeastern region of India. As I said, complexity, it is totally complex. As you understand, the seismic hazard is not the same here in northeastern region of India. It is totally different. And as a result, here, no ground motion prediction equation uh, pertinent to, uh, I mean, northeastern region of India from local uh, I mean, seismic network has been utilized. It has been all the GMP that has been utilized is from intraslab uh, and of course, subduction zone earthquake. 
and that is to uh, reverse faulting mechanism, strike slip faulting mechanism, and also subduction zone mechanism. And what this seismic hazard map indicates that the uh, hazard is really high in, from uh, Indo-Myanmar region and uh, if you and also from uh, near Bhutan Himalaya and also, uh, also from Arunachal Himalaya near Tejpur and all. And now if you happen to uh, remember the uh, mm, mm, what is called uh, strain map, that particular map is really coincided with this seismic hazard map. But again, I reiterate that we don't have down motion prediction equation out of our network. So there we have to work hard to establish the ground motion prediction equation, incorporating all the tectonic uh, seismological domain, tectonic domain, geomorphological features, the slip rate, mm, uh, the focal mechanism solution, the rupture assessment, the uh, directivity measurement, uh, all these are an input to uh, this particular seismic hazard assessment. So, as I understand, this seismic hazard assessment map is, is still, there is a lot of much to be yet to be resolved and for uh, this particular reason. So, this is the, as I said, seismic hazard map for one second and this is the gross one as you have seen already this is for one second period and this is for three second duration and as i say you for uh, many particular cities there are 13 populated cities there are these 13 populated cities exactly uh, i mean really uh, it is more than five million people uh, stay in uh, these cities and when we see Mm, the estimated peak ground acceleration from the probabilistic seismic hazard assessment map, this is something comes around 208 centimeter per second square to 210 centimeter per second square. So at the end of the day, when we wish to build an earthquake resilient society, we have to understand that these are the prime information that we have to incorporate in our seismically seismic design uh, in such a complex region. So in conclusion, we know uh, the uh, source characterization. But here the question is the dominant mechanism is still yet to be resolved. We know the stress map, but the directivity is yet to be resolved. Directivity is puzzling us in different seismogenic uh, zones and which could be the probable source zone for a potential earthquake and where really is it so that we have to answer more rigorously and uh, we have done some active fault mapping we have estimated some rupture area of 1950 in zone 1987 1897 is still to be resolved so uh, uh, these are the, some of the questions uh, that we are still left out in this particular region of India. And above all, incorporating this particular uh, information for information, what I have presented, we have uh, estimated the seismic hazard map of India. But the question is how much realistic it is. Uh, so this virtual workshop really a platform that I invite uh, now you understand that how complex the region is, northeastern region of India is. So through this virtual seminar, I invite the international participants to uh, collaborate with us to answer these questions because uh, a comprehensive study on these issues is very much required to understand the complex geodynamics of northeastern reason of India to a realistic one so that a earthquake resilient society we can build. With that note, I conclude. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your excellent presentation.
It reminds me the extensive field work that we carried out uh, in Orasal Himalaya with Professor Paul Taponier of Art Observatory of Singapore. Thanks for your brilliant talk. Now, let me invite Professor Ziar Kail, the session chairperson, for his opinion. Over to Professor Ziar Kail. Yes, Santano, thank you so much. Yes, I have. I think I have no words to to really express my sincere thanks and gratitude to Saurav. The way he touched upon every aspect of seismology, <clears throat> how he has effortlessly attempted to understand this ultimately the seismic hazard map of Northeast India, and his elaboration of the two great earthquake zone his geological implications, then coming to fault plane solutions, stress inversion. I think everything was well explained and uh, we are all enriched and enlightened. Thank you so much, Dr. Sora Borua. I think there will be some lot of questions, so I hand over to Dr. Santana Borua now. Uh, we, we have with us Professor Ramesh Singh from Sepman University. Yes. Uh, so may I request Professor Singh for his uh, uh, Good evening to everybody. And uh, uh, for me, it was uh, too early. I'm a night owl and I work uh, quite late. Um, OK, but uh, it was a very excellent lecture. Please, and I really conflict um, Dr. Balwa for giving this and this Ever since uh, I was doing uh, my master's uh, and I considered the Assam as a very complex because uh, the stresses are uh, from three sides and uh, now uh, still it is going to be complex because, uh, because you see you, we have drained oil and we are draining oil from Assam and when we are draining oil, the stress regime is going to change. And also the area is subsiding. The area is subsiding. And I'm very happy that uh, uh, they are publishing very good papers uh, of a 1950 earthquakes, because they, in, 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 in India, if some earthquake occur, we forget about very fast. OK. But the, uh, after uh, seeing this, the U.S. people, they they try to hammer continuously about an earthquake to understand the processes. And uh, this is uh, very exciting that uh, this institute, <coughs> Northeast Institute, uh, people are working and people are trying to do this. And uh, uh, I would like to see that the multi-faceted parameters, the observatory, uh, is the now operational and one has to integrate all the parameters uh, okay so once again i i thank uh, dr balwa for giving such an excellent uh, talk and the area is uh, very complex and no doubt about that and now we have uh, so many tools available to understand the processes Okay, so there are very interesting questions. Um, uh, maybe Dr. Burwa can uh, answer this. Okay, and I would uh, also like to jump, uh, you know, answering questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for your nice comments. Now, may I request uh, Mr. Prasidjo for question and answer session. About the Prasidjo. Thank you, sir. Uh, with, your, uh, uh, with your permission, sir, I'm going to read out the question answer. So the first question is, uh, why earthquake cannot be predicted? This is a very small question of a graduate student. Please do reply. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, this question actually deserves if we can answer a Nobel Prize. And still, till today, a lot of investment, a lot of research has been conducted, but uh, uh, I mean, no 
formidable uh, uh, i mean answer could be given for these uh, kind of uh, questions as you know uh, first uh, great earthquake in china uh, that has been uh, forecasted by a lady scientist uh, uh, in tangshan earthquake and uh, which was really came true but again there is another more earthquake hiking earthquake that could be that was also predicted but could not happen so so there is always a chance that prediction is uh, uh, 50 50 so uh, but the work is going on uh, there are several studies uh, on uh, different multi parametric uh, point of view Uh, uh, all the geophysical uh, uh, mapping is going on simultaneously and, and in various parts of the world and uh, uh, as uh, professor singh has also said ground observations atmospheric observations all are being uh, critically reviewed and integrated to answer these questions so uh, hopefully uh, we'll see but Uh, uh to answer this question i would like to say uh, that we must focus more on earthquake resilient uh, society by developing seismic proper seismic hazard map rather than forecasting earthquake or forecasting an imminent earthquake thank you for your question uh can i add uh, something here <coughs> because yeah. this is a from the graduate yes sir yes sir You're most welcome, uh, sir. Yes, thank you. From the graduate student, and uh, he or she is asking why earthquake cannot be predicted. The earthquakes are occurring four kilometer below the earth, and it, let me let me tell the now we the doctors uh, after within a month or fifteen days they. Uh, if you are pregnant, uh, they 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 say that the gender of the baby. Okay, why is that? The body is so small, but here we are dealing with a large body, four kilometer deep, and our observation is only on the surface. Okay, so this is a very very complex situation, and earthquake occurs in a different environment. so if we have a cross bore hole um uh, observations inside the earth then we might get a clue otherwise and which is a, which is a not possible you see so the we are trying people are trying to observe the multi parameters okay but uh, we have to uh, understand all all kinds of signals thank you thank you sir for your brilliant answer uh, prashant job is good yes sir so the next question is uh, eastern boundary of rodan and assam shows very low seismicity compared to other part what may be the reason and whether this is a position of seismic gap what is the potential magnitude for this region and what will be the maximum focal depth for this region yeah it's a very good questions if we happen to see the seismicity map of bhutan himalaya stern part is totally devoid of earthquakes and there is a uh, large earthquake that occurred i mean in bhutan himalaya so far in 1872 and uh, to the west uh, southern boundary of himalaya activity is prevalent but in the northern boundary towards northern boundary or eastern boundary the activity is not at all it is uh, we cannot say that it is uh, i mean uh, uh, seismic gap but yes it's a debatable questions and this questions has been answered that stress partitioning of Bhutan Himalaya to the uh, uh, Shillong Plateau is continued through the convergence, and the convergence rate rate is very high uh, uh, between uh, uh, Bhutan Himalaya, that is the HFT region, and the Shillong Plateau, or uh, uh, rather I'll say the 
southern part of uh, Shillong Plateau. So that converge, convergent rays, convergent rate might have caused some kind of uh, uh, stress partitioning uh, in that particular region uh, in Bhutan Himalaya. And uh, uh, some paleoseismological uh, studies already been done. And that particular paleological study uh, right at this moment say that uh, there is no much potential uh, right at this moment for a large earthquake in Bhutan Himalaya. And the predicted recurrence, uh, estimated recurrence um, value is some theme sometime around uh, 700 years or so. So that's what I can say. But may I request uh, our chairman uh, to and uh, Professor Kayals uh, to enlighten these questions in much more deeper depth. Oh. Oh, thank you so much, uh, Saurabh. Uh, I think it's a very, very pertinent question. I think you have you have explained well. Uh, one more point, uh, which uh, the other day, Professor from Canada, he was explaining, as you explained the stress partitioning, uh, Sri Lanka <laughs> is taking up most of the stress and there is a stress partitioning, so, Hima, so Bhutan Himalaya is not that much stress. He also explained that Kofili fault is also by, by you know, stri strip mechanism, it is also taking up much of stress of the convergence. So Kopuli fault um, is another, you can say, uh, another zone which is taking up much of stress and Bhutan, that way eastern part of Bhutan uh, is not that much stress for, uh, for generating earthquakes. One is that we explained that Silang plateau is taking up, then the Kofili fault is also taking up. The other explanation that Professor gave that the, that at the Bhutan Himalaya, that uh, ramp, the rheological state of the rocks in that ramp zone, you know, it is it is in a more, much more on a you know creeping stage than the accumulating stress. So there are three four factors presumably that stress partitioning, the Kofili fault are uh, taking up the mass stress by <coughs> and then the ramp which is which is uh, is a stress accumulator in the Himalayan earthquake for the Himalayan earthquakes in below Bhutan Himalaya that ramp uh, rheologically is not taking a mass stress it is creeping rather you know, rheologically, the rock is not strong. So I think these three, four factors are, as you understand as of now, are the main regions that we don't get much earthquakes in the eastern part of the Bhutan. Thank you. Thank you, Saurabh. Thank you. Uh, Thank, you, add, Thank uh, you, Yes. Uh, yes, sir. So, Saurabh, can yes, I yes, add? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, Please go ahead, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, the, my wild thinking about Assam, why why there is a low seismicity? Because uh, this the Assam is located in a triangular region. If it is a only compressional, tensional forces, it, the two direction forces, then there is a good chance uh, for the higher seismicity. Here, this is the triangular situation, and uh, then it is getting balanced. And what is needed to understand this, we must enhance the dense network of GPS, which can give you uh, the direction of the stress. Okay, so that is very, very, very important. And also here, when I said the the, there is a, the region is subsiding and the, we should also get a vertical uh, uplift. Okay, so this is my wild thinking. Uh, this is a very important um, location. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Prasadja, for next question. <laughs> yes, sir. The next question is, what is the difference between doing inversion using P-wave and S-wave? 
will uh, will the result the same yes uh, there are two techniques that uh, either you can invert the amplitude of p wave as well as the s wave and the entire waveform uh, so there are three types of waveforms you can uh, consider while doing uh, uh, waveform inversion and uh, the main target is to resolve the focal mechanism solution identify the focal mechanism solutions so uh, mainly uh, if it is a teleseismic earthquake uh, we basically prefer to resolve with p wave amplitude inversion if it is very much local earthquake we prefer to do with s wave in uh, inversion and the most robust thing is uh, to utilize the complete waveform while uh, inferring the focal mechanism solutions through waveform modeling. So that's the your answer. Okay, sir. Uh, Navajit Moli wants to know. Okay, for last, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, is there any possibility of reactivation of the Oldham fault in near, near future, which could be entirely change the topography of northern part of Meghalaya Plateau and southern part of Gualpara and Kamruk district of Assam? Because we know that as a result of uh, 1897 great earthquake, Sandubi Lake was formed. Yeah. And that's a very good question. Uh, I mean, Navajyoti, really it is a very good question. But uh, I mean, recurrence period, as I mentioned, the 1897 rupture zone, rupture area has not been uh, estimated as of now, as of today. We are looking forward to that. But a lot of work has been carried out, no doubt, but still, that uh, rupture area has been uh, has not been resolved. Now the question is, Chandubi Lake was formed because of 1897 earthquake, but uh, in, in a sense, uh, the remnants of Chandubi and the remnants of uh, 1897 earthquake, when we did some uh, paleoseismological studies in uh, Gualpara region, uh, and near Dudnoi region by, uh, I mean, professor uh, from Institute of Bengal uh, Science, Bangalore, uh, C.P. Rajendran and Dr. Sukija from Anjara Hyderabad. So in C.P. Uh, Rajendran's paper, uh, which was published in uh, I mean, Tectonics, uh, where I was also one of the authors, and we found that uh, in that particular reason, the uh, recurrence period for a large earthquake of that magnitude is sometime, something around 550 years. So as we understand that uh, at this moment, that recurrence period do not match exactly with the Oldham fault to be reactivated. So I would request you to go to those two pioneering paper by Professor Sukija and uh, and Professor uh, C.P. Rajendran. Thank you, sir. So I am very much thankful to Professor Ramesh Singh, Sepman University, USA, Professor Jair Kail, and Dr. Swar Purva for your kind support and encouragement. Now may I request Dr. Sinmoy for vote of thanks. Over to Dr. Sinmoy. Thank you, sir. Good evening to all. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. It's my privilege to propose a vote of thanks on this session. I, on behalf of CSR NIST and the entire organizing committee, would like to thank Dr. Saurabh Burwa, sir, for such an informative presentation. Sir, you are enlightening us it is really helpful to understand about the complex tectonics of Northeast India. My sincere thanks goes to respected chairperson of today's session, Professor Zayar Kail sir, for his continuous support and guidance throughout the event. I express my same, uh, deep sense of gratitude to 
chief guest of today's session, Professor D. Amico from, of University of Malta, our special guest, Professor Ramesh Singh, Chapman University, USA, and special innovative, Professor Mehdi Jare, IIEES, Iran, for being with us and encourage us. We are delighted to have you with us today. Thank you, sir. I also thank uh, to our director, CSR News, Dr. Zian Sastri, for his support and cooperation. I must thank convener of the in, uh, of this international workshop, Dr. Santanu Borwa, for giving such an amazing platform to interact with such eminent personalities in the field of seismology. Last but not least, I thank all the participants across the globe for their active participation and all the members of the organizing committee for their tremendous effort to make this international workshop a big success. With this, I thank you all of you once again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>